Welcome everyone to um, Jubilee for All, Holborn West, uh, our evening worship, and welcome those who are joining live and uh, those who will be uh, catching up with the recording. Um, we're continuing with the Psalms uh, this evening, and um, later uh, Joanna Redmond's going to share with us a bit about um, a project in Brazil, uh, having come back recently from the country of Brazil. So a special welcome to Joanna and we look forward to what uh, uh, Joanna is going to share with us um, this evening. Um, I'm conscious that some of the Psalms we're dealing with are, are heavy, they're, they're difficult. Um, the Psalm that we're actually looking at this evening is Psalm 137. It's got some of the most difficult words in it in the scriptures. And uh, we'll come to that. And yet it is a well-known psalm and it's a well-loved psalm because um, certainly the first part of it is a lot you know, of poetic imagery. And you're going to hear a version of Psalm 137 sung and you would have no idea that it's got a, quite a painful part at the end of it. It's quite an up-tempo uh, version of the psalm and it was a big hit. Um, I think possibly back in the 1970s and it was by a group called Boney M and it's called By the Rivers of Babylon.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, version of the Psalm 137. Um, I must say, I've, I've always uh, enjoyed Boney. Um, they had uh, a number of interesting songs. Rus Rasputin was another one, and uh, quite quite a few hits um, um, back in those uh, days. So I thought it might be nice to have a kind of uh, cheerful version of it, because some of uh, uh, what, what we explore is, is uh, quite hard um, because it's exploring the theme of exile, uh, of being out of the comfort of home, of one's own nation, but uh, a stranger in a strange land where sometimes um, treatment is, is cruel and um, unfair and unjust. And um, maybe there's something about uh, say the group Boney M or, um, or uh, you know, Caribbean uh, singers or, or um, black singers have something of almost managing to transform something that is difficult and hard and painful into something uh, where faith is still expressed, faith that God is still in the midst of it and uh, going to lead people through it. Um, so my prayer um, is taken from the Church of Scotland Pray Now booklet uh, and the heading is Exile and it's referring to the psalm that we're going to hear shortly. Let us pray. Lord, we haven't been to Babylon but each of us has our own exile to contend with. The inevitable exile of growing into adult life, the hard graft of human experience, relationships, health, money, work, conflict, guilt, death, childhood, forever past. And what of this? when we measure that by the silence hanging over Auschwitz, that terrifying symbol of all forced exile. No songs, no hope, a one-way train to exile and death. Lord, what are the choices for exiles? Looking back in remembrance, anger, revenge, genocide, even the slaughter of children. Lord, deliver humankind from the evil that is born of persecution, the hatred that festers in places of alienation. Make hope our only choice, Lord. We pray tonight for those who have lost hope, whose souls are prey to despair, we bring before you the homeless, the refugees, the asylum seekers, and so many others besides. We sing for these by our prayers and deeds, the new song of compassion and hope. Amen. Well, I'm going to read the psalm, and this is in the... I think someone has just arrived. <laughs> Alfie's excited. Anyway, let's uh, listen to God's word in the Old Testament in Psalm 137. And this is from the, the voice uh, translation um, of the Bible. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. When we thought of Zion, our home so far away. On the branches of the willow trees, we hung our harps and hid our hearts from the enemy. And the men that surrounded us made demands that we clap our hands and sing. Songs of joy from days gone by, songs from Zion, our home, such cruel men taunted us, haunted our memories. How could we sing a song about the eternal 
in a land so foreign, while still tormented, broken-hearted, homesick. Please don't make us sing this song. O oh, Jerusalem, even still don't escape my memory. I treasure you and your songs, even as I hide my harp from the enemy. And if I can't remember, may I never sing a song again, may my hands never play well again. For what use would it be if I don't remember Jerusalem as my source of joy? Remember, eternal one, how the Edomites, our brothers, the descendants of Esau, stood by and watched as Jerusalem fell. Gloating, they said, destroy it, tear it down to the ground when Jerusalem was being demolished. O daughter of Babylon, you are destined for destruction. Happy are those who pay you back for how you treated us, so you will no longer walk so proud. Happy are those who dash your children against the rocks, so you will know how it feels. Amen, and may God bless to us the reading and hearing of his word. Difficult words, but very expressive words, and we'll uh, return to them shortly. But uh, the Jubilee Music Group are going to um, lead us in, a, in another uh, version of uh, Psalm 137. It's uh, hymn 94 in the fourth hymnary and it's by the Babylonian rivers. <laughs> today I made mention of A.A. Uh, e. Milne, the, the author of the uh, Winnie the Pooh books, and um, I was just uh, researching a bit about his religious views, and he said one or two um, interesting things um, on the subject of religion, although he didn't speak much about it, but he had written a book um, in honour of peace, and then later he wrote a book in honour of war, and he tried to explain his decision while remaining a pacifist to join the British Home Guard. And this is what he said, in fighting Hitler, we are truly fighting the devil, the Antichrist. Hitler was a crusader against God. And His best known comment on the subject of religion was recalled on his death. And I wonder what you think of this quote. And he may have been thinking of a reading such as uh, Psalm 137, or maybe some of the readings um, in the Old Testament, whereas the cleansing of the Canaanites and the Philistines um, from the country. But this, this is what D. A. Mom said. The Old Testament is responsible for more atheism, agnosticism, disbelief, call it what you will, than any book ever written. It has emptied more churches than all the counter-attractions of cinema, motor, bicycle, and golf course. So, he obviously wasn't too keen on the Old Testament, um, but there we are. I just thought I would um, uh, read you that quote. And perhaps, and I know many people would struggle with 
this um, expression at the end of uh, Psalm 137, how I long for your children to be dashed against the rocks for the destruction of families and children. Um, and of course, I think it's important we see it in context. I think it's expressing what the people in exile were actually thinking and what they would have received themselves um, when they were invaded and sadly tragically it was a common occurrence in war at that time that the object was was devastation and destruction of all age <clears throat> all ages all genders and so it's almost as though the israelites or the the ones that are um expressing themselves through the psalm are wanting the same to happen to their enemies the babylonians who have taken them and driven them into exile now that's difficult that's hard and it's a painful expression to hear um but these feelings are raw and they are expressed and of course we're looking at this psalm and it would only be right to consider the context of all the psalms and not just to single out one psalm uh, we've got to be very careful of using a verse or a scripture to justify our thoughts and our feelings and of course when we move to the new testament there is an emphasis that jesus gives in loving your enemies but I would want to defend the Old Testament for its expression of what people do at times think. And one commentator says that about this psalm, our Sunday best is not what God wants. God does not want us, <laughs> literally or metaphorically, with our nice clothes, with our nice manners, with our civilized ways to come to him only in that way. God wants us to come to him with some of the awful thoughts and feelings we have, some of the ugliness that we know we might express consciously or subconsciously. Basically, God wants us to come to him as we are. And as I say, that includes within us the things that are raw, uncontrolled. And you could say that this psalm, certainly the latter part of the psalm, is that sense of coming to God with all these different thoughts and feelings just brought to the fore. Many years ago, I was involved in counselling uh, for folk with alcohol and drug addiction problems. And one of the counselling methods um, was when people had all sorts of hearts, bad experiences, wounds that had led to very strong feelings of anger, of, of bitterness, um, of fear, of a sense of revenge or whatever, that they be given a chair and a room all to themselves and basically encouraged to let it out, you know, to express it, to just pour it out, all those things. Um, and the idea of that was that the person could bring things to the fore, not necessarily with someone in the room, it could be an empty room, um, but that they could let these things out um, and that this would be of help, of healing, rather than always suppressing them, holding them back, and then them sometimes bubbling out in the wrong situation or the wrong time because something had been triggered. 
And uh, I suppose I thought of that when I thought of this psalm, that it's an expression of that anger with the Babylonians. And again, the beautiful imagery of being by the river of Babylon, of the waters of Babylon. But it's also worth noting that what is happening is uh, they have been working uh, long hours, basically as slaves. And then when they are down to the river, and when they are going to rest, their rulers, the Babylonians, are taunting them to sing the songs that they used to sing back in Israel. It's almost a further humiliation of what they have already been through. So there's actually a lot of provocation going on um, by the Babylonians against the Israelites in this particular context. And therefore, it's understandable. I'm not justifying and I'm not defending, but it's understandable how very strong feelings of bitterness and anger come to the fore. But perhaps we think this is very removed, uh, very remote from ourselves. And in many ways, I wish it was so. But again, if you think of the Babylonian uh, tormentors, you may also think of some of the Nazi, Nazi uh, concentration camps where musicians were forced to play when others were being taken uh, to be put to death. And those instruments, they were forced to play uh, during the time of the Holocaust. And as I said, the object often in war in those days was the devastation, the humiliation uh, of another nation, and then for it basically to be um, robbed of all its resources for the conquering nation. These things have happened in recent times. The killing of children is common practice in war. If you think of the wars in Vietnam and the use of napalm that would destroy whole communities. We think of more recent times in Iraq and the Middle East of chemical warfare, again indiscriminate. And of course, nuclear warfare, as with uh, bombs in Japan. And so this type of uh, destruction is not just something of Old Testament times. Even with more modern weapons, that type of destruction, a uh, devastation, is expressed probably, indeed, definitely on larger scales and numbers. And then if we were to even take that further, if we think of the division between rich and poor, and, and some of that has come to our attention maybe with the uh, COP26 in Glasgow, the uh, poorer nations who are more um, at the mercy of the environment and uh, the damage uh, that is being caused, whereas um, wealthier countries to some extent have resources to sustain and defend more than um, some of those that are suffering poverty. And so in many levels, this psalm challenges us uh, if we go beyond the Israelites desire for revenge against the Babylonians. It draws attention to the reality of a uh, warfare, of destruction of nations. But I don't want to finish on that note because I know that's a very sombre and uh, disturbing note. The positives I want us to take from uh, the psalm as well as opening up to us the realities of things that happen in life um, are that God does want us to express ourselves as we are. He's big enough to take anything we feel or think 
and as we express ourselves more fully to him, I believe also that God can work a healing minister within us and enable us to see things differently and to see things more mercifully, eh, more lovingly, more hopefully, and maybe more sympathetically eh, to those who are suffering. And as we journey on and interpret the Psalms in the light of the New Testament, we have the model of Jesus, who on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and who through his ministry is able to confront the injustices, the oppression, the wrong that is happening, and enables people to change to a different way of living. And so thanks be to God that that psalm is not the end of it. It's not the end of the story of the people of Israel or of exile. There is still a message of hope that we find in the context of the Bible that gives encouragement and strengthening to those who do suffer wrongly at the hands of others. We are now going to hear a psalm by Ian White, uh, which um, is expressing something of, of, of God leading his people, helping his people. If the Lord had not been on our side.
Thank you very much for having me. Um, I was in Brazil last year and at the start of this year during the pandemic. Um, and the experience that I had while there, particularly while volunteering at a small grassroots organization in a poor community, is something that I want to share with you and ask for your help. So um, first, um, if you can, pic picture this. So you live in a heavily populated community in a makeshift house made from bricks, sheet metal, wood, and really any other material that can be made use of. When it rains, the water comes through the gaps in the bricks or down the side of the sheet metal roof. The water supply is sporadic, meaning that you can go without water for several months at a time, instead needing to queue every day at the nearest building that is lucky enough to have water. You work as much as you're able to, to put food on the table for your family, but this is always a struggle in the best of times. Your children go to school, but this way of living does not lead to a good learning environment, and so their grades and their progress is low, and the opportunities to improve this is almost non-existent. Violence is commonplace in your community, but you would never be able to rely on the police. They can be the most violent out of everyone, in fact. And actually state organizations do not really have any positive influence in your community at all, whether that be policing, healthcare or social care. You live in the same community as the other six, uh, sorry, same situation as the other 6,000 inhabitants in your community, living in about 900 makeshift houses. So that's an average of six people per house. And this is how your family has lived for several generations and how your neighbors' families have lived for several generations too. And like your neighbors, there is a high chance that you're descended from enslaved Af African people brought to Brazil by Europeans who, once slavery, slavery was abolished, were left with no help to make any sort of lives for themselves. Just in the same way that wealth is inherited and passed down the generations, poverty is also inherited. And the, so the cycle goes on and on. Um, yeah, I imagine this is a pretty difficult situation to try and imagine and to relate to. And I know it is certainly for me. But if you can keep imagining this situation, um, imagine now that someone in your community steps up and leads the way in dealing with these issues that you and your community face. So this is what a lady called Joycey is for her community. Um, and that's in Hesifi in the north, northeast uh, of Brazil. Joycey created and she runs a small grassroots organization called Grease, which means Amulet of Protection and Luck. And uh, the symbol of Grease is just behind me in the, in the background here. Um, it is clear to anyone who visits Greece, Greece as I did, um, that it is the center point of the community and that it is able to provide essential services in the community because Joycey understands the problems and the solutions because she is part of, the, of this community. 
Grease focuses particularly on children and teenagers and their mothers. So remember those children that I mentioned before who are struggling at school? Well, Grease offers extra support to these children in a safe environment where they can be taught, for example, literacy, environmental education, art and music. You struggle to buy enough food and other essential household products. And so Grease can support you with this, with basic food, medicine and cleaning parcels. The harsh reality of life lived this way is not only dangerous for your physical health, it's harmful to your mental health too. And so Grease helps with providing various therapies and other therapeutic activities. So this is how Grease and Joycey support the community in the best of times. But as we all know, the last year and a half have been probably the worst of times. As you can imagine, the pandemic made an already precarious situation even worse for so many people, uh, not only in Brazil, but in other parts of the world too. But anyone who knows anything about the Brazilian president Bolsonaro will know that helping people in need is really not high up on his list of priorities, to say the least. Leaving communities like Joyce's in a pretty dire situation. Now imagine having to choose between going out to make some money to feed your family or keeping your family safe from the coronavirus. It's a choice that many of us in the West didn't have to make at all during the height of the pandemic due to furlough schemes and government support. But I do know that we, you know, we have all lived through this same pandemic and it's been uh, difficult here too, of course, with most people finding it yeah, a really difficult time, feeling isolated, feeling uncertain of the future uh, and dealing with the loss of family and friends. Now imagine having to deal with all those things on top of not being able to feed your family without putting yourself, your family, your community at great risk. Uh, it's really an impossible choice to make. The catastrophic number of deaths that Brazil has recorded over the course of the pandemic shows the grim result of people having to make this choice. Over 600,000 deaths were recorded officially, a population three times the size of Aberdeen. And this number is supposedly way under the true number due to undercounting, with some reports estimating that one in every 200 Brazilians has died in the pandemic. In just one week during the pandemic, my boyfriend's mom knew four people that died just in one week, which is really unimaginable for me. I don't know about for you. Um, and it's the poorer communities like Joyce's that have taken the brunt of this pandemic due to not having the luxury of being able to self-isolate. So now imagine you're in this community once more at the height of the pandemic. And once more, there is a ray of light for you because Grease is able to offer you and your family basic food and supplies, meaning that you can stay at home and protect your family and community as best as possible. And so Greece managed to help about 200, 250 families um, over this summer. Um, and with their Christmas appeal, they aim to have an even bigger push to help 500 families in total. But this work, of course, takes a huge amount of work, time, effort, and of course, money. The pandemic has really made it harder and harder for Greece to support, uh, to provide the volume of support that the community needs as more and more people couldn't put food on the table and came to Greece for help as the panic, a pandemic wore on and on. And month by month, uh, Joycey still doesn't know if they will have enough money to meet the demand, uh, nor to even pay the, the rent and bills of the property that they, that they use for their uh, activities. So while I was in Brazil last year, we volunteered at Greece between, it was between the first and the second waves of the virus. Um, but at this time, Joycey still hadn't resume, resumed the in-person activities with the children because so, so, social distancing wouldn't have been possible. But instead she used the time to renovate the property that they use. And this is what we helped with. So although I only really saw a small uh, snapshot of the work that Joycey and Greece do, uh, it was very clear um, how caring and loving Joycey herself is, how much she has put into this organisation and how much Grease really is at the heart of her community and how essential it is. But it was also very clear how big a financial strain they are under, especially after the pandemic. 
Joycey relies on volunteers um, and financially she relies on one-off or monthly donations to keep providing these services that she's so passionate about providing. So now uh, a call to action. Can you support Joycey and Grease by donating some, some money? Uh, obviously a fundraising campaign is not a long-term solution, but there is a real need right now uh, that could be somewhat relieved by raising some money. Um, so I, I set up a, a GoFundMe page um, that people can donate through. I'll, um, I can post the link in the chat, but hopefully I can send something around by email um, if I can arrange that with Duncan and with Verna, um, maybe along with some photos so you can get more of an idea of, of Grease and the community. Um, and actually in the future, it may also be possible to give regular donations to Greece. It's not currently possible outside of Brazil. Um, but yeah, having a regular and predictable income makes it much easier for them. Um, and so, yeah, if it is possible and anybody wants to, they can, um, yeah, to do this in the future, they can, they can uh, speak to me about it. I just wanted to say um, thank you to, to Pam in, uh, from Holborn West, um, who after Duncan spoke a little bit this morning, I think has already gave some support, which, which is very, very kind. Um, yeah, I just wanted to end by saying that, uh, yeah, Greece is a really funda fundamental part of the community that it serves um, because it works locally and it understands the challenges locally. And Joycey, the lady that, that really is solely behind it, really is an amazing woman who takes so much onto her, her own shoulders to provide what she can for her community. Uh, and by, by supporting this, you would be supporting a grassroots organisation uh, where donations would go directly into helping a community in need. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening and for having me, having me here. Thank you. It's great. Th thanks, Joanna. And it's great to hear of, you know, something that you've you've witnessed yourself and seen yourself and you've seen the uh, you know good um the, the the difference it's making for for people's lives so, yeah well, well, th well thanks very much joanna i'm um i think we should probably bring the service to a close if there's not any burning questions at the moment but uh we're certainly happy you know to um, let folk know ab ab about the project and invite people to support it because um, um, yeah thank you yeah okay so we um close with a, a spoken blessing and then um, we're going to hear from the jubilee music group um a song blessing night has fallen but let us hear these words May God unlock treasure for you from deep places. May God unfold new aspects of his character. May God undo any knots that hold you back. May God unleash new power for good in your life. May God uncover gifts to grow your faith and fruitfulness. And may the wonder of his being keep you steady in his service this night and always. Amen.